afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tony Fusco. I'm one of the co-producers of the Boston Home Decor Show. I'm really thrilled to have Ashley Rooney here with us today. This is Ashley here. Ashley is the author of more than a dozen books on art and architecture. And as I was doing my research uh, to decide what kind of programs to offer, I was thrilled to find out that she is actually living in the Boston area. <laughs> Makes it easy for you. <laughs> Which was perfect. It was super. But then I was even more thrilled to find out that her most recent book is called Condo Makeovers. Welcome. Welcome our panel. She'll introduce our panel. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Kelly. How many people are already in a condo? Oh, a lot of you. And how many people are thinking about a condo? Besides me. <laughs> I know, I look what's happening here in Boston and New York. It's very exciting. It would be really nice to be in one of these slick New York apartments or Boston. And now, instead of facing the snow and the leaves and all the rest of the things that I do, I live in an ancient old house out in Lexington, and I'm getting a little tired of it, perhaps. Those stairs are getting to me. But with me today, I have two people, three people I've worked with, and I've just lost one of them. <laughs> um, and it's several books. Charlene Keogh, Keogh Design. She's the president. She comes from New York. She's been in about four or five of my books. I think her design is phenomenal. Thank you. I'll get out of the way because I will block it. So, um, I'm Charlene Keogh, uh, owner of Keogh Design, and I work out of New York City, although I get in a plane a lot. My clients are all over the country and, for that matter, all over the world. And uh, because I work in New York, I work with a lot of international clients, and that's really fun. Uh, because they bring a whole new set of criteria to the table that uh, you don't often see. And so I've, I've learned to really learn how to communicate for those of them whose English was not a first language and to also explore their um, ideas and their um, uh, references from their countries and bring it in. And so it's a lot of fun. But having said that, I, this is a client that was actually Greek, uh, but is a doctor in New York, and he had very specific ideas. Uh, and when we first got this apartment, I, I specifically did the before and after because one of the things we want to talk about today is all the craziness that you encounter when you walk into a building and you get to see what the previous person did and, and try to fix it. And so I spend a lot of time fixing other people's mistakes. First, you get the architecture right and then you go on and do the interiors to your client. But this was a space that you can see this sort of odd shaped um, curved soffit that had nothing to do with anything in the apartment. There was no two soffits the same height in the apartment. It was driving me nuts. And this client originally called me in to, for a paint job and pick up sofa. And I ended up just trashing the whole place and starting over. And so... And he liked it. Oh, I loved it. Yeah, that was great. This, there's a, I could talk on and on about the perfect client, but this was yeah. one of them. And Because um, he got it, and he was willing to take that leap. You talk about excitement and exuberance of, of clients. When you get that client who signs on to your excitement and gets gets your excitement and wants to participate in the project as opposed to just handing it to you and say, here it is, let me move in. And the contractor gets excited. It just becomes this collaboration that takes the project way up here that, that wouldn't be otherwise. But here, I, I used softening that had not been there. Uh, I think this one existed, but none of the others did, and, and created the sense of entry into the lobby or into the foyer, and did a. You walked in the front door here and went immediately into the kitchen. Not good feng shui. So I did a sliding glass door that was opaque and hid one of their um, beautiful pieces from Greece in so that actually when the door is, is over, you can still see the art piece through it. So there's, there's lots of little tricks that you can do. Um, I just floated a glass shelf here, put a big mirror in because it 
mirrors always help to create space. Um, and then did a custom uh, chandelier just to make it a fun space. This particular client loved a lot of color, as do I, and so we, we just had a blast doing that. So. Um, before, this is what I inherited from the previous owner. Uh, lovely, lovely. Can't move the column. <laughs> That's another thing you encounter in co-ops and condos is, is there's things there you just can't move. So you figure out how to work around it and, and uh, I created a, an asymmetrical cabinet that holds a TV behind a mirror. So there's a TV there, but you can't see it. Um, sliding doors into a back room that we really didn't know what to do with. Um, and we decided to make it an auxiliary formal dining room. Um, let me see if that shows up. Yeah, so you come through these doors. This is a seating room with an office, but we created this bench seat. These coffee tables raise and lower and then flip open and become one long dining table. So we, she actually seats 24 in there. Oh, um, but you know, this is what was there before. So um, a lot of cleaning up that was done. And, and as always, the sofas were being addressed everywhere. Uh, bedroom, you can see before, we did a lot of built-ins. They had a, a beautiful terrace out. Uh, lots of color, a lot of fun. Uh, and cheap, they want, they, they had both lost 50 pounds each, and they said the treadmill will go in the bedroom. I said, all right, so you do what you gotta do. Before, there was a bathroom with just a sheetrock wall, and it was very narrow and very dark. And so what I did was put a wall with the door, and it's all frosted glass, and it, by the nature of that, I created another three inches. Now you say it's three inches. Three inches is a lot when you're up for space. And so just by making it um, a wood structure with glass, we were able to create more room in the bathroom and let light in. So you didn't feel you were in this cave. And then I, the, the doors to the closets became um, a solid version of that. Um, this is a completely, different, oh, I want to go back and say something. All the walls in this um, uh, apartment were eight feet high, uh, ceilings, I'm sorry, were eight feet high. How do you make those ceilings higher? Well, I, I do gloss, high gloss ceilings and it becomes a mirror and it just takes your eye through the ceiling. And this was one of the first times I did that trick and it really works. So that's that's one of the tricks that I've uh, come up with. Um, this is a, a loft space, and this was designed uh, by an architect, Mark Winkleman, and the client moved to London as it was getting finished. It was rented out for 10 years, and then they called me in and said, come come, put it back. Rescue me. Rescue. So this had been done by Mark in this whole upper story. Uh, again, it was covered in. I guess builders love to just cover in spaces. This is a 20-foot high space. and uncovered a whole area, um, which I'll show you in a minute, but I wanted to point out the fireplace. This is what it came like. And this is a modern apartment in Tribeca in New York. Hello, you don't put a colonial fireplace. It was out of scale, it was wrong, and so what I was able to do was to emulate this shape in the fireplace, uh, you can see it here with the curve, and just fix it. And this is the space above that was was gained just by finding it. Um, color, loves color. <laughs> uh, Can you make the pole something playful there? Yeah, so the poles exist and these were clad in metal and used as light sources for lighting all the art pieces. Nice. This ended up being a custom made sofa because this was a client that holds a lot of parties in their loft, and, and yet they want to be there intimate as a family. And so the, the challenge here was to make a big, giant space into intimate and for large parties. So um, so if I had to seat a lot of people, uh, but you can see they, they have panels, they, they have music concerts in there. And oh, and you can see this was white, and you know we turned, we added color just around. Um, the kitchen, I don't have it before in this, but the before was just builder white cabinets. And, and they, they still live in London, so they didn't want to spend the money to redo the whole thing. So I said, let's just put new fronts on. 
so, and there was no backsplash. So I managed to find a uh, tile that tied it all in. And so there's little tricks, you know, as a designer, you're brought in to either do the whole thing or part of it or a piece of it, or, and you've got to work with what's there. Um, and, you know, bird's eye view here. This is a kitchen, and I want to use this to show as a prime example of what you find when you do demo. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. Demo is, is the interesting part of, of life in a condo and co-op, because you never know what you're going to get. If you can see here, they had a very low ceiling, um, a table washer machine in the, in the kitchen. And this is what I was able to do with it. I found literally 20, almost 20 inches above that ceiling. And of course there were beams and cross beams and things going on, so I just figured out where all the beams were at and then worked with it to create a coffered ceiling. Um, still had the round table because she loved it. She inherited it. Um, she inherited this kitchen when they bought the apartment. Um, this is a client I met on the East Hampton Jitney, chat, chat, chat for three hours. Oh, come look at, we're looking at this apartment, we have no idea, they pull away all the detail, we don't know what we're doing. Net, net, they hired me to do the whole apartment. Ten years later, they hired me back to do the kitchen. So, um, and so she had lived with this round table and loved it for those ten years, and, and it worked, so I, I kept the concept. But, in pulling away all these walls, I literally gained, in this distance, six inches. Now, again, you don't think six inches is it's, it's a lot. I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's the difference between walking through like this and being yeah. comfortable. Yeah. Um, this is a close-up. You could really see that low ceiling and a curved wall, or a, a wall here and a door that were totally in the space. Um, I was able to push all that back and create an enormous amount of space. Uh, but again, you see the high ceilings. Um, and is that stone top? It's beautiful. The photograph's it's, beautiful. It is a, a, a granite top. It's, 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 yeah. it's like nice. It's a beautiful stone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Is that was also on the round table too? Yep. Ah, we just made it. Yeah. Just put a stone on top of that. You made a curve around because, again, in a small space, you want to maximize how how much how the, the, the largeness as much as you can. When you start mixing up materials, everything gets small again. So I try to keep it really clean and simple. Um, this was the back door, the service door, and we stripped it down to paint it, and we both looked at it and said, "Ah, it's great. Let's just leave it." So it's rough and raw, and uh, you can see this was what was there before with the ugly little fan. Um, this isn't exactly showing side by side. Let me see if I can. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, I can't get it. That shot didn't make it in. So, um, but so that's the kitchen. But you can see how just by doing demo, we created all this space. Um, this is what this is a favorite project. Um, the client hired me to redo this bathroom. A brand new building built in. I don't know, 2000 something, and they said, we need our bathroom fixed. It was the smallest apartment I've ever worked in. They literally had two closets that were about this wide, and they said, we don't care, but we do need storage in the bathroom. And this is a your classic five foot by seven foot bathroom. There's absolutely no storage in there, no space, no nothing. And what I was able to do was I narrowed the toilet, so it's, it's a uh, total narrower toilet and I was able to create more storage here back to the cabinet back so that it's rather than being 24 inches deep it's 20 inches deep and floated a sink on it brought the mirror down to the counter so it automatically makes the room feel double in size and I did a really cool I think it's cool uh, aluminum floor uh, on, and so it, it, it's actually warm to the feet oh, really? and so it just became this this wonderful environment um, and one thing, you see my shiny ceiling again, but I, I tend to put a little uh, sky tint in it just, just to make it feel a little bit sky-like. But the other thing I did, here you can see, you know, just standard ugly cabinets. But the studs, and the, this, because it was new construction, the studs were only uh, two and a half inches. And so 
normal stones are three and five eighths, which makes a wall about four and a half inches thick. These walls were only three, but I took the, the space between the studs and I made uh, medicine cabinets. And again, if, if you look at what you're storing in a bathroom, most of it doesn't need any more space than this. But suddenly she's got two full length storage units. So that's little tricks that you can do to make more space. What did you cover them with? This is a back, um, a beautiful piece of glass that has a, a um, not a mirrored back, but like an aluminum back. Oh, okay. So it has a little shimmer, but it doesn't, it's not, we didn't want to reflect it. Yeah. So. Excuse me, I have a question. Sure. Uh, the aluminum floor, uh, can you say something about your thought process behind it? I mean, why did you go that route as opposed to something else? Um, interesting question. I, we just wanted something that was a little different in feel than normal tile. Um, and this apartment was really modern, the rest of the furniture in the apartment. And I can't explain it other than to say tile or stone or the normal materials just didn't feel right. And we were having this conversation earlier. When you run into a product or a person or a, an idea that just sparks the imagination, it, it just, your brain just goes out there. And so I found this aluminum tile in one of my favorite stores. I'd never seen, he didn't have it before and I just happened to see it. It just felt right. So that it's just a feeling. Um, I didn't necessarily go looking for it, but it just it just felt right, and, and the client immediately just loved it. She said, "Fantastic!" And I, what I did not know is how warm it would be, literally and feel. It's it's a it's a warm floor. It's not cold. So um, I've since used it a couple of times and, and with similar results. See, what what prompts my question in part is uh, I used to work for Kaiser Aluminum mm -hmm. in industrial sales. And um, you know we, you know we didn't service the, the, the retail market, but um, this was a, 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 for me a, a very unique application for. Oh, great! <laughs> you can use it as an advertisement later. Yeah, there you go. No, that, that's great to hear. Uh, we were just visiting one of the um, vendors out here, and he was, was talking about how he does hidden drawers and things, and, and we, we got all excited. We were like, oh, another idea. We can build on this. And, and just as designers, we see things. We're constantly seeing things and looking at things and turning it into something that you wouldn't imagine otherwise. And, and that's what gets me up in the morning. Oh, so th I'm ending on this. This is this is classic. The kitchen that I showed you, as we're doing demo, not only did we find 20 inches in the ceiling, but behind three layers of sheetrock, which means there were three renovations before my client bought the apartment, they hid a live electrical panel. This was a live electrical panel with 30 circuits in it that were live and hidden behind the walls. And you just... You know, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> you just go, what? And so as I call this project my archaeological dig, because every time we took a layer off, we found something else. And we gained yeah. six inches in the space by just taking back what other people had done. So one of the things we're probably going to talk about is how to make space, how to make space but also how to do it legally. <laughs> Most of the yeah. 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 I have a question for, for General or anybody that would. Speak so loudly. The idea of um, form over function, function over form. I'm curious to know how you balance those two, those two issues, whether uh, you know, some designers uh, sometimes put form over function without taking much consideration into the actual functioning of the way people live in the space. Yes. And some designers, you know, start with function. And so I'm curious yes. how you balance that out when you do Joseph said he had the answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have an and, 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 and I have a comment after that. Yeah. So, so um, go back, go back, way back to the Roman architect Vitruvius who first wrote about architecture and design. And he said there are three ingredients. Fermitas firmness, commodity, so that's your function part. Firmness, commodity, and then the third word was delight. 
you get the first two. It should firm should be it should stand. Yeah, we hate when our buildings fall. It's not bad karma. And com commodious, it should provide a function. Uh, at the very least, have a toilet in the. Otherwise, it's kind of not so convenient. But delight is equally important. It's 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 as important as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? Get your basics, but right there at the same time, reach poetically up high for what makes us who we are. Oh, I see a nod over there. Charlene, do you want to add to that? I, I just, I'll add a more pragmatic answer, which is I approach it where it must function first. It has to function. If it doesn't function, it's not the, the, the client is going to be mad at you for the rest of their lives. But it also has to be beautiful, and so the, you you think of both at the same time. But you like me fixing all the soffit heights. I had to fix that first before I could even think about the the, 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 the beauty. So things that bother you, you fix, and you fix flow, and you fix things that aren't working, and then you go in and at least that's how I work. And then you go in and address the beauty. Exactly. But it, does that also apply when, when you are... A little louder, sir. Sorry. <laughs> I, I my Does that also apply when... Well, I'll make an uh, observation. From all the pictures that I saw, in some cases, to my eye anyway, I saw furniture, or furniture that was uncomfortable to me, that did not look like you could like, you know, sit in it, kind of lounge in it a little bit. Very low couch backs, no support. Um, so I, I noticed that. Uh, I'm not making criticism, but uh, but sometimes um, I think that uh, you know sometimes like in very high design, oftentimes the idea of how comfortable it is, how functional it is, is a little bit lower down on the scale because it's extraordinarily beautiful design product, you know, that not, is not necessarily comfortable. I'm going to respond since mine looks at yeah. the modern furniture. First of all, I design a lot of the furniture, and while it may look sleek and modern, I build it custom to the client so that it is comfortable. So when you saw the very clean lines, when you sit in that sofa, you still sink down into it like it was a big old comfy sofa. So I... So you had both? I have both. Yeah, I got both. And you also got to think of who the client is. Yes. Maybe right. they're my size, or maybe they're much shorter. Yeah. And then they're a whole different thing. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, yeah. How do you go about setting budget for this? Because, um, from the client's viewpoint or from the client's viewpoint? That, that, I mean, how does that work? Um, that actually, at the end of the day. Well, it's one of the first questions I ask. It's like, what's your budget? If somebody tells me your budget's $50,000 and, and they want an entire apartment renovated, I just said, not happening. So, um, I think that has to be one of the most um, honest communications you have. You know, any good relationship, it's good communication. So if a client comes in and says, okay, we want this, this, this done, and this is how much money I have, and we will say, with this much money, we can give you this, this, and this. If you want all of that, this is the budget you should be thinking of. So, you know, they have to make choices. But, but, but my experience, I, uh, maybe I'm uh, normally, but it's always much more than that. <laughs> 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 our first client said there's, there's a rule about this whole process, and he was a builder. He said it's going to take longer and cost more than you think. Period. It happened to me. I'm in the business. It shouldn't happen to me when I design my own studio. But you, you know, I'm following my passion. And you're always weighing. You're always prioritizing. Like, okay, it would be nice to do this, this, and this. But really, this is where I want to focus on. And I've never regretted. I tell you what, I have been kicked for. I had a client come to me and said, "I've seen your other work." And he goes, "And I'm really upset because you should have pushed me on these two issues. And I really don't like what I've done." Oh. Tomorrow I'm going to be in Midtown Manhattan working on an asset manager's office on the 39th floor of 1700 Broadway answering that. I'm getting a second chance on an office that I did 
13 years ago. And now he has done very well for me. He kept, he kept saying, you know, I wish I had done that. And you were right. I should have made these out of plastic. plastic. <laughs> and I'm actually in the middle of that job right now. So very interesting. The other thing I will say is, as a designer, clients have to be educated about what can, can and can't be done. And a lot of times, one of, it's in my contract. The client will not, if the client talks to the contractor, you will report to me what you said because the client will talk to the contractor and the contractor will go, fine, not understanding that it affects not just that, but that, 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 that. So I'm here to stop that kind of thing from happening. And if a client, if we agree on a budget, we stay on that budget. That's it. And often I find myself yanking the client back and saying, eh, 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 we can't do that. Unless they say, okay, I found another, you know, grandma died. Yeah, you know, your grandma died and I had whatever. But you do have times when you want to go more and the client doesn't yep. get it and you stop and then at the end of the project they say, ah, oh, I wish. So it's a balance. It's, it's a real balance. Yeah. You had a question. Um, uh, yes, I have a question about ceilings. But I, can I make a comment? When we built our house, the story was that you give your architect an unlimited budget and he exceeded it. <laughs> <laughs> But the question was, um, where were you when I was around? <laughs> this way, um, when you were talking about the appearance of the ceiling to make it higher, I kind of missed that. Was it that you made it shiny? I made it shiny, high gloss. Uh -huh. Well, there's there's a bunch of layers in there, and again, it comes to, speaks to budget. It um, that particular one, we literally just painted the painted it a lot in a high gloss and sanded it in between. It's probably four passes on that. It's not perfect, but it was good enough for this particular client. I have another client that we went in with a special plasterer. He was in there for a month, plastering, replastering, plastering, plastering, and adding uh, Venetian plaster, which lends a really beautiful sheen to it. And, and it's, you know, so you, there's, there's a bazillion ways to do it, and there's, there's a bazillion cost differentials on how to do it. But the end result is it acts, it just takes your eye through the ceiling. It doesn't, your eye doesn't stop at the ceiling. It's almost to the point where I, I can't paint a ceiling in a mat, in a mat anymore. It just, it just hurts, <laughs> especially when I've got a low ceiling. There are a lot of these hints in the book, because um, a lot of different architects and designers talked about how, what they did to expand the condo, because usually condos are a lot smaller than our houses. Particularly in New York, it's where every square inch counts. Okay. Well, uh, so, to get a reference point, because I'm moving to New York. <laughs> uh -huh. Meet Charlene. <laughs> the 87th Street apartment. Um, put a number how much the construction budget was and how much the furnish, you know, the interior design and furnishings, and how many square feet. The square feet footage was about 3,000 square feet. Uh, it was big. It was big. It was a whole. It was a penthouse. It was the whole floor, which was weird, being eight foot ceilings and being so small. Yeah, that's hard. Um, the budget. How much did this spend? I think overall, between construction and furniture, and lots of cabinet work, lots of cabinet work, it was about about six and change, something like that. How many years? Seven years ago. This is a, that's why I'm having trouble with calling. It's about uh, eight years ago. Yeah, eight years ago, there's going to be a big yeah, there's going to be a, a little bit of difference in there. So, yeah. Six hundred, seven hundred thousand, something like that. She said six hundred. That wasn't bad. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking of the eight years, and I'm looking at what's happening in Lexington. You know, how things are going up just in the price of the kitchen. Well, there's, you find ways to do things. As, as Joseph was pointing out, you find ways to do things that are cost effective and, and give you the most bang for the buck. And I, I take great exception to your statement of, um, you know, the architect and then it's, it's, it's this and then it's that. I work so hard to not make that happen, to make that not happen. I mean, it's, it's, if you hired somebody like that, I'm sorry. 
So, <laughs> hope that's not going to happen to you all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are there other questions? Because I had one for you all. Which was your most exciting challenge that you met? And no, not the flood one. I already know the flood one. <laughs> but if you could just come up with a, one interesting. Well, right off, right off the bat, um, I told you how we work with builders and we do something called the Rasa table, where we actually bring the builders and the clients and everybody gets like five minutes and about five colors of pencils to make sketches. And the idea is that, you know, everybody makes a sketch. We're not looking for beautiful art, but we try to figure out, oh, there's a problem. So we knew these windows on the apartment were a problem because they're right on the river and the water is pressing right against them. And you want to look at the river. By God, you know, it's like, why would I? And so, how do we how do we deal with this fact? Well, the builder made a quick sketch of, a, of a, like removable thumb screws, and in the you know in the second iteration, so so we all made sketches, and he was like, this is a lame sketch. You know, we're talking about rooms and spaces, and he's working on the window. And then we do a second round where everybody's stealing ideas, and somebody else gets the idea of the window that he drew, and says, wait a second, if we could make the windows removable. So, because you get a warning when the flood's coming. You, you know in the news that you, they're evacuating the town. If we can make the windows removable, the water can come right in. It's not gonna smash this, it's over $5,000 worth of windows. Um, they're actually removable. Everything else in, the, in this space was completely waterproof. The pressure now is not gonna remove that. They actually get to move the windows up to dry ground. And when, when, they, when it comes down, so that technique that we, we figured out in the Rasa table came from us just basically saying, hey, we've got a problem. And every one of those windows has one, two, three, four, a little Makita screw gun, boom, pops them out, they carry them upstairs. It's about five minutes a window to literally remove it. Have they had to do it since you built it? Um, so it's a hundred year flood, officially speaking, um, because, uh, uh, because we have new ideas about global warming, uh, we think it's going to come sooner. Charlene, do you have a challenge to share? There's so many. I can't even pinpoint one. But okay. um, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Okay. Just because it, there's every job is a challenge, and it just yeah. Yeah, we have another one that we're working on right now. Think of one of them. I keep showing this because uh, the, the things we've been talking about are in this book. And it, it's, okay, we've been doing this for almost 30 years. We learned stuff <laughs> from this book, so that's why I keep referring to that. We're doing another challenging project right now. It is, um, they're condos, they're duplex condos. And one is about a half story higher than the duplex that it's attached to. So we have a client that decided to buy both and make it one huge, what, 12 bedroom house. Oh. So the challenge of, of one, you're working with different, oh, so the, the first two people that owned these houses, well they were the first one that owned one of them. You're dealing with different aesthetics, you're dealing with different things that people renovated and trying to pull it all together. And that's when our Rasa table thing that Joseph was talking about comes in really handy. <laughs> because we have the client and the builder, and in this case there were some homeowner restrictions that we had to all pull together. So, it's, well, it's always interesting. <laughs> I do have my challenge. Okay, I, had to, I had to sift for a minute. I'm, I'm doing a, um, uh, you know, 1806 building in the village. A, the, I'm sorry, I'm doing, my mic is not, I guess. Um, oh, yeah, it is. is it? Yeah. Oh, I'm doing this, this um, apartment in an 1806 building, and the, the woman has literally bought the former attic space of this building. So we've got this, this straight roof coming down, and she said, I want a terrace. We're in Landmark District. We have a board, we have to go through all these challenges with the building department. Two years later, we're just now making our way through the uh, landmark version of this in order to do a four foot wide terrace on the back, which means cutting off the roof by about three feet and creating this little terrace, which means inside the building we have to run new new um, uh, beam structure and also waterproofing and all of that. And we have the world's biggest nutcase for the board, head of the board. <laughs> and it just, it, it's like you just can't make this stuff up, you know? <laughs> it's just, it's just yeah, crazy. It's really 
So. Charlene and I were talking last night. There was an article recently, I think it was the Wall Street Journal, about new kitchens, appliances that are coming out that are much smaller. They still charge you the same price they would charge for the real, the big one, but now you can get the small stove, the smaller dishwasher, which would be nice in some of these smaller condos, I would think. Yep. I mean, the whole problem is usually how to find space. How to find space. To, and even, literally, I keep saying it, inches count. I mean, sometimes if I can gain two inches, it just means a whole different layout than if I can't. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. If you're looking at my antique house. Are there any other questions out there? This is your one time. Yes. Yeah, we have one time. Oh, goodly. What should clients or customers prepare before they approach you? Is it easier to tell them, I don't know what I want, tell me, or would you rather make somebody stop and research and kind of ideas? Go, go on pals, go through magazines, show us stuff, bring things that you like. Give us an idea. One of the first things I do is define terms. I can say modern, you can say modern, but we're talking about yep. two different things. So let's define what you mean by modern. I don't care what I mean. I want to know what you mean by it. So bring me as much as you can to show me what that term means to you. It's not that I'm going to design exactly what you show me. It's, it means that it's going to get my creative juices going. And it starts a dialogue between us so that the project goes up here as opposed to staying down here. And, and that I call it's the programming session, right. standard stuff. Right. And, and I, to me, the programming yeah. session is the most important meeting in the entire project. Yeah. And do you ever say to someone, do you ever say, like think about it like with uh, some, something in the south end, do you want something like very industrial, high end? Do you have like a conversation to coach them or do you just wherever they want? That's what oh, it's 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 awesome. you're the one that's going to be living in it. Yeah. And I think what's important to us is that. Like we tell people, whatever you think that you just like, rip it out of a magazine, do it, get do a Pinterest page, whatever it is, and you might think that you're giving us something out of country living and then something out of modern builder, and you think that these have nothing to do, but we're all trained to say, oh, this is the feeling he wants. Right. It's not that he likes this color or that wallpaper. This is the feeling that they want. Exactly. And the more you give us of a variety of things to help us, the more we can bring your dreams into reality, and as I like to say, within budget. Right. So the, the more things you rip out, the better. So Julie, to go back to the question that came from over there about budgets, Maybe if I came in with three items that I would really like and my budget, and you could then give me the feeling of which ones would give you the most for for, my, for your dream. For my dream, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. exactly. Any other questions before I take the bikes off? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, Thank you. Uh,